so give us your thoughts. Here's a great question. What kept you going? What kept you going through tough times? What kept you going through the tough times? Don, I just saw you uh, chuckle. Uh, is there a, was there something that um, that you uh, thought of or did to sort of pass the time? Well, when I was overseas, I wanted to get back home and see my wife. <laughs> did you think of her a lot? Earl. Probably uh, most of them are thinking the Lord kept most of us alive, alive, and mm -hmm. wanting to stay alive. And you've often heard, probably, as many church on meetings you might have heard, there were no atheists in the foxhole. <laughs> Some pretty difficult times. I know, as Earl said, on several occasions, I can name three of them. The Lord did likewise. Thank you, Colonel. Mr. Scott, you're a POW. Yeah. What what got you through those those difficult and dark days? Well, that's a there was quite a few things that happened during the dark days. Uh, the main thing that I always were, was thinking about was the day that I would get my freedom back. Uh, and we were always looking for something else to eat or something to smoke. Uh, <laughs> I think the cigarettes kept us Because I would imagine in a BOW camp you didn't have a lot to eat. Goodbye. You didn't have a lot to eat? I, I can't eat. Did you have a lot to eat as a BOW? Did they feed you well? No. Uh, <laughs> we would get uh, for breakfast, we would probably get uh, a bowl of uh, barley. And, uh, and lunchtime, we would probably take a slice of the bread that we had, the awful taste and stuff, and put some butter on it, spread some sugar on it, so it would kill the taste of the bread. And at nighttime, we would get, for 24 men in the barracks, we would get a 10 quart bucket of spuds. And they were very small spuds. So when you peel it, it was just about the size of a mall. So we, we just didn't get a whole lot of food. We did get some Red Cross parcels. Sometimes we'd get a full coat parcel, sometimes a half, sometimes a full car, a full parcel. All depends on what the German would bring in. Mr. Scott, what was that like to finally gain your freedom? We heard a lot of emotional interviews in the theater not too long ago. What was it like to finally get your freedom? Well, the night that we were liberated, uh, the Lucky Strike Hit Parade was on the air. <laughs> and the number one hit parade, uh, parade song was Don't Fence Me In. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever see a bunch of men cry, you should have been there. Mr. Scott, thank you. The, the, the next morning, Got up, we had to go up to roll call, and uh, the three flags was on the flagpole the American, the Russian, and the British. And we all stood there and cried to see our flag once again, to know that we were free. 
Thank you, Mr. Scott. What was the most memorable moment for you in the war? What was the most memorable moment for you in the war? Anybody care to answer with something that you think about often all these years later? Mr. Bloomquist. Uh, yeah, Ben Check Charlie. Ben Check Charlie. What, what, what's Ben Check Charlie? He was a guy, a German pilot, who uh, came over, uh, that flew over Omaha Beach uh, every night after D Day for several, several nights. And uh, the Navy was out there with all these thousands of ships, you know, and they, they let loose and they tried to get them down. And, and I found myself cheering for the guy. I hope he gets through. <laughs> Did you remember, was this just like clockwork? Was it every yeah, single day? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was double summertime over there. It must have maybe 11 o'clock, and just we getting gray, and we'd see them. Uh, uh, you'd hear that little, just like Piper Trot playing, and you hear that little thing like a washing machine motor. <laughs> and uh, and if you uh, grew up on a farm, you know, where you didn't have electricity, they had gasoline powered uh, washing machines. But that's what it sounded like. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bloomquist. Any other um, answers, something that sticks out uh, in your head each and every day? Mr. Tatum, what, uh, what's your thought right here? Mr. Bloomquist, could you uh, pass the microphone to um, Mr. Tatum, please? We also have an airplane that just had every night on Water Canal. We call him Washing Machine Charlie. <laughs> Then we had Tokyo Road that you and us on. And it was all the news of where we were going to be bombed the next night. <laughs> so Tokyo Rose was not a not a friendly. Oh, I had a beautiful voice. <laughs> yeah, and she'd sing to us. And then tell us how many of us were going to die the next day. Was that demoralizing for you, Mr. Taylor? No, it aggravated us enough that we did we turned it around. And probably the, you know, the key memories myself and many others have is when they're thrown ashore. And in all, all respect to the Navy guys here, got to the point where they call them <laughs> Most memorable moment for you, Mr. Bailey? I'd like to mention uh, four memorable moments. Four? <laughs> Sunday afternoon, December 7th. I was out with some friends. During the afternoon, we came back to the friend's house, and my father said, I've been listening to the radio. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor this morning. The next day, December the 8th, I was a junior in high school, sitting in the cafeteria when President Roosevelt made his Declaration of War speech. The other memory I'd like to mention is uh, June 6th. I had been on a night shift uh, helping, uh, I was in the radar unit helping train night fighter pilots. We'd uh, done the night shift on uh, June the 5th, and June the 6th I was in the barrack, just come in from the night shift, and, and somebody had the radio going, and I heard the announcement about the uh, landing at Omaha Beach in and, uh, Norman. And the fourth memory I have is the end of the war. In uh, Norman, Oklahoma, getting dental work done. <laughs> and I went to the theater, and that's when the announcement was made that 
Great celebration. It feels like, uh, thank you very much. Lou? That's so hard to follow up on a couple of them. Uh, when you ask what sticks out in your mind, there's a lot of stuff, which I'm sure they all have memories of. But one of our uh, jobs was uh, to land off these Higgins boats at night. We never had any daytime landings, we had all nighttime landings. And I, uh, we had to be very sneaky about it, we had to be very quiet, and all that sort of thing. And, uh, the front of the Higgins boat was flopped out, and you hit, uh, felt something inside of coral on your feet. You felt you were very, very lucky. Well, on this one landing, everything was going great. And just as the Higgins boat was about to pull away, this little gun that he has on the back, I'm not sure what caliber it is, maybe God might know, but it was fired. Hello, here we are, boys. We're coming to get you. You know, that is pretty scary. And I don't know what happened to that guy. Uh, I know what <laughs> maybe it should have happened to him. But uh, anyway, everything turned out OK. And my other memorable moment was uh, uh, in June, the end of June in 1945, when I was discharged from the Marine Corps. <laughs> Mr. Cunningham. Shell landed on our deck uh, shortly after that bombing. Uh, we were all firing at the other high aircraft uh, on all the ships around, firing at the, sh at the plane. And uh, shell landed on our deck 20 minutes or 20 feet from. Mr. Rowe, I have to ask, you were um, a POW yourself? Mr. Rowe? You were a pilot. You were a pilot? Yes, I have several memories. One memory sticks in my mind is when I was assigned a 10-man crew for a B-24 bomber and I was 19 years old. You were 19? And that made quite a shock to those members of my crew to know that they were trained to go to combat with a 19-year-old pilot. <laughs> However, I solved that problem by turning 20 years of age as we finished our training, and I went overseas 
at 20 years of age, started flying my missions. We got shot down twice in 13 missions, and the second time we became a POW. And I would like to mention just that our POW time in Germany was spent at Nuremberg. However, the Germans in a frantic panic at the end of the war were trying to move the POWs to prevent them from being recaptured. And they put us on the road between Nuremberg and Moosburg, Germany, down near Munich, which was 162 miles or 138 miles. And this 138 miles was made by following a mimograph sheet of paper down through the Bavarian countryside with no German guards whatsoever. We wandered down through there, and they allowed the Switzerland to bring in Red Cross food parcels, neutral Switzerland, and they gave us nourishment through these Red Cross food parcels, and we traded the cigarettes and we traded the chocolate with the natives along the way, with the villagers, and enjoyed our springtime tour down through the Bavarian <laughs> countryside going to Mooseburg. Finally, we got to Mooseburg, and we were there only a short while till Patton showed up with all his armor tanks, and we were liberated, and it was in the 8th of May, 1945, the war was over, and we had to start our journey back home. And it was made in C-47 aircraft by flight over to France, and they processed us as Camp Lucky Strike, Chesterfield, <laughs> and Paul Mall, named after American cigarettes. Now, I don't think we could do that today. <laughs> However, we processed there, came back to the States, and then had 30 to 60 to 90 days of evaluation in hospitals near our home. But there were very memorable times for Honest Kim, the working man's friend. <laughs> 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 A couple of tough questions here, gentlemen. Um, you go to war with some buddies. You don't come back with all of your buddies. What was it like to lose a friend in war? So many of them I lost. You lost a lot of friends, Don? How did you cope, Don, with uh, the loss of so many friends? How did you, how did you cope with it? Dealt with a lot of emotions. Um, did you ever get over the sadness, Earl? 
Because you, you did have a job at hand. Yeah, no, you don't get over it. it I'm not doing it for years. Got some put you where you're at there. You got some kind of a delayed memory to just pop it up. But yes. that's all I can say about that. That war is not the city. Most of you students have some idea of what the, the South Pacific looks like. Look at Hawaii. Go down past that to another to the west of Samoa, two Samoans. You go on down, you start running into the Solomon Islands, and so on down to New Guinea, then down to uh, Australia, and across a little piece of water to New Zealand. That's what the Japanese were after. They were already, now I'm sure this is probably not in the history books, they were already bombing Darwin, Australia, serious bombing. And the Australians were just thinking of death to see us show up down there. And so were the New Zealanders. They had already, all of them had put uh, machine gun ports all along the coast, and they put the equipment in there to help build up sand barriers and that sort of thing for landing crews. And uh, New Guinea was being shot up pretty bad too. And about a third of New Guinea had been taken by the Japanese when our army went in there. Then uh, when we went into the Guadalcanal, that was the very first aggressive war effort in the world at that time, in 1942. Others Mr. Billy, you had something to say as well. well I guess I, was just, guess I was just lucky. I'd gone over as a replacement in the bomb group. The squadron four of that had been white flooded. I went in with a four officers and crew, my crew, we were together. We'd go out on missions and some plane wouldn't come back, but we wouldn't know it. So we were always together. And, uh, so I never really lost anybody, because before I went through, I never did anybody else in the crew. So I was very lucky. Maurice Miller, um, for you, uh, and, and being in the Air Force, uh, what was uh, what was that like, and what theater of operation were you in, sir? I was with the 8th Air Force, 94th Bomb Group. I was with about 27 missions, and it was a valuable learning experience view of tragedy, with a view of excitement. I wouldn't take anything in the world for the memories and the friends that I made, but I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> that was one of the questions too, Mr. Miller. <laughs> All kinds of stories come out. I'll tell you one that I think personifies what war is all about. After the war ended, a couple of days later, I was asked to fly a group of 8th Air Force planning officers around Germany, northern Germany, so that they could get a look at what their planning had done to Germany. You can't imagine what Germany looked like from 5,000 feet instead of 25,000 feet. We took off from England, crossed over, Flew around the Ruhr Valley, which was the German industrial heartland, down to Frankfurt, back to Germany, back to England, and it was a, a site of the destruction of German cities. It was unbelievable. And it was done mostly by the 8th Air Force. The 9th Air Force did a quite a bit of it. But we were the ones that did the heavy penetration in Germany and daylight bombing. The British did it at night. And Germany was just devastated. The large, heavily populated cities were destroyed. There were skeleton buildings and a little more. After the war ended, a 
two months later, I went over and was assigned to the flight engineering team at Temple Hop Air Drone, which was in the American zone of occupation. People that were cleaning up Berlin were mostly old ladies in a long black dress wearing using stick brooms to sweep away the dust that came from buildings that had collapsed and was trying to rebuild some of them at that time. But Germany was just destroyed completely. The people Germany had been divided for occupation purposes into four zones. The American zone and the Russian zone were by far the largest, and the British and the French each had a zone. Berlin was divided into four zones like that, Russian, American, British, and French. Vienna was the same way. But Berlin was so thoroughly destroyed that there really wasn't much left there except Tempelhof Air Drone. You were unarmed. <laughs> you were unarmed. They were armed. We were unarmed. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't know whether they were armed or not. Yeah. Mr. Miller, thank you. Uh, and one other little story I'll tell. I had a good friend who was flying B-25s in Italy in the 15th Air Force. And he was badly shot up on a mission and left it home on for fighter support because they'd seen a number of German fighters back and forth and attacking the B-25s. And here he was all by himself, limping on one engine, and calling for fighter support. And over the radio comes his voice, keep your pants off, white boy, I got you covered. <laughs> the 99th fighter group, which did escort work, they flew P-51, and they really did a noble job and escorting and defending uh, American bombs in Italy. But I the Tuskegee that. Airmen? Hmm? The Tuskegee Airmen? Did, they were the Tuskegee Airmen. No, the Tuskegee Airmen, right. That's yes. The 99th Fighter Group. They were from the Tuskegee flight, flight School. But I just thought that was a perfect response to a radio call for you. <laughs> Keep your pants off, white boy. I got your cover. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Miller, thank you. Uh, Mr. Phipps, you had the microphone. Uh, were you going to uh, share a story with us? Uh, after uh, the 6th Marine Division uh, returned to Guam after the campaign on Okinawa, uh, I went back to my unit, 4th Marine Regiment. Uh, I was in uh, Naval Hospital there. And uh, a few days later, we were called out to the company street, and we were told to pack our sea bags, pack a combat pack, and stand by and fall out in an hour. Well, we did that, and of course, there was a lot of scuttlebutt going around. What's coming off? Must be a small operation. And, and, uh, not so because everybody figured we were, we 
we, uh, we didn't get any replacements. The company was pretty well shot up, so uh, maybe it's a training mission. So we went down to the docks on Guam and immediately started the load ship. A lot of rumors flying around, just where we're going, what's happening. So we got the ships loaded, ordered the, the transports, and set out to sea. About two days later, we had a, uh, a briefing that uh, there was two bombs dropped on Japan. They didn't know, nobody knew uh, anything about atomic energy. And, uh, well, uh, the Air Force was bombing the hell out of Japan all the time. And we figured, well, maybe they got some big boys in there. And so as a couple of days went by, we were told that uh, atomic bombs and we were kind of baffled what the hell was in time to find. <laughs> and it was new to everybody. So we had uh, this explained to us. And we were told that uh, uh, the 4th Marine Regiment was going to be the first to land in Japan on September the 30th. And that was a big surprise to us. So. Of course, we had uh, our full combat packs, ammunition, hand grenades. We had all our tools of our trade with us. And uh, we landed at a place called Yokosuka, or Yokosuka, however you want to pronounce it. It was a huge Japanese shipyard and naval base south of Yokohama, I guess about 30, 40 miles south of Tokyo. And uh, we were the first occupation troops to land there. And uh, it came so quick within days from getting out of combat, just going to start our training schedule over for the invasion of and within days, here we are in Japan. And uh, uh, it was, uh, there was no Japanese uh, civilians allowed on the street. There was a curfew for about three days. You could see uh, some of the residents peeking out the windows and so forth like that. And uh, uh, we just, over and, and uh, our Provost Marshal uh, moved right in with the Japanese police and both of them worked together. Of course, the Provost Marshal was in command, but uh, that was uh, a big surprise and, and a great experience. Something to never forget. Yes, Mr. Rupp. bombing raid in history. There were 2,046 four-engine bombers put over Germany on that day with 853 fighters. That meant 200, uh, about 21,300 airmen were over Germany on that particular mission. And you ask how you feel about seeing some of your friends and so forth go down. But I want to tell you that survival of the fittest does move in and as long as these airplanes were dropping out of the sky, at least it wasn't you, and you were always thankful for that. And when your turn came, of course, you took your turn. However, we never really got real teary-eyed, but we did lose a lot of friends in this combat operation. Mr. Rob, thank you. Mr. Bloomquist, you had a, a comment. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Slots and Sands in England? Mm -hmm. Well, that, uh, um, that was a
Marines is laughing, by the way. The U.S. Marine is laughing at all. Mr. Timberlake, um, were you in the South Pacific in the Navy? No, I was dry land sailor in the USA. Dry land sailor in the USA. <laughs> was a
And Mr. Lundquist, you, you, you were a little jealous of that, right? They had three, you only had one. Well, not in my bed. <laughs> you can even have it. Uh, gentlemen, I just want to run down. I want to get how many years of service, if you can. Just get that uh, number. Mr. Timberlake. Two and a half. Two and a half. Uh, five. Four years, three months, and three days. Is <laughs> that Kendall? Four years, three months. Sir? 21 years. Mr. Miller? Four active and 20 reserve. Four active, 20 reserve. Karen? Four. Four years. Three Mr. Yuka. Three and a half for Mr. Yuka. Mr. Bailey? Two and a half active in the Marine Corps in World War II. 20 months active during the Korean War. And I'm still in the Air Force Retired Reserve. Thank you. <laughs> so five, round up to five. Active right here. How about you, Mr. Miller? Three years, three months. Mr. Cunningham. Three years and a half. Then I stayed in the Naval Reserve and took active duty during the Civil War. So three and a half? Three and a half during World War II, and then after the war, I still stayed in the Reserve and went on back on active duty. At least a couple of weeks. <laughs> 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 I stayed in the Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> so I could fly AT-6s around Richmond. <laughs> Mr. Scott. Two and a half, yeah. Two and a half years. Mr. Phipps. Eight years active. Mr. Wilson. 31 years. 31 years. And Mr. Rowe. 20 years, six months, and eight days. I stayed in. They taught me to fly, and I wouldn't give it up. <laughs> Kendall, do you have all those years right here? Uh, put your math skills to the test. And we just have a, a, a few quick moments here. And I have uh, one question. Here. What was it like, very briefly, gentlemen, what was it like to finally reach the United States after fighting in the war? Mr. Rowe? Well, it was a welcome relief to get back home again, coming back as a POW. Coming back as a POW, they assigned us to hospitals near our home for 90 days of evaluation and treatment of hepatitis and malnutrition. And so, therefore, it was a relief to get back. But it took a long time, and it took, seemed like forever to get here from Moosburg, Germany. But we made it back. I'm glad you did. What was that like, uh, Mr. Seaton? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> of course, of course. We have, uh, let's see, we can do this. We have probably about uh, five minutes. How about that? I'm going to take five minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, he wants to be the last one to say, well, you are a colonel, so we can give you uh, uh, preferential treatment. But uh, what was that like um, to finally reach the United States after war, Mr. Bailey? So 
that, Ms. Miller? In Sacramento, California. Any other pleasant memories? Mr. Scott. We come in I can go uh, on a ship that we've been on, out on the sea for 18 days. It broke down up there. And uh, then we left that, went to Camp Henry, which is down near Yorktown, between Yorktown and Jamestown. And the commanding officer told us, says, men, you can do anything you want around here that you want to do. He said, because we know what you've been through. He says, but uh, I do want you to have on pants and a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so a whole group of us was out walking down the road, and uh, we just had our caps and our belts. MD come down the road, he says, uh, hey, soldiers, we didn't have any anything to show what their rank was or anything. He says, hey, soldiers, he says, put them damn hats on. I turn around to him, I say, you go to H. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, well, he says, uh, I'm going to put you in the brig. I said, you can do anything you want to do. I said, but you better call your commanding officer first. I said, because if you mess with me, you are going to the brig. <laughs> So finally, he got a lieutenant around, and the lieutenant told him, said, you better go on about your business. He said, because them men has been out, at, out in places that you've never been. So that was one time that I had a good time to tell my young people to go to We had hands on. We had hands on, too, right? Colonel Seaton, who actually saw action uh, and was in the Battle of the Bulge with that gun. This has been a wonderful situation to get together with all of you. Uh, the gentleman sitting behind him over, over overlooked one thing that I uh, think you should know. He flew combat missions in two theaters the European theater and also the Far East. Is that not right, Charlie? 25 and 29. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, in coming uh, to this, I always want to remember our comrades, classmates at BMI. Seven of the Malay rats, as we call them there, their names are on the wall. I never forget that. Names of the first three men that I lost in combat in Sicily. Every time I hear the people play tats, those names go across my mind, and they always will. Now, with those solemn statements, 